Thank you. I would like to start with the acknowledgement of the country. We would like to acknowledge the Wiradjuri, Nugunawal, Gundungara, and Biripi peoples of Australia, who are the traditional owners and custodians of the lands on which Charles University's campuses are located, and pay respect to their elders, both past and present. Thank you for joining to this third uh, research colloquium organized by Center for Islamic Studies and Civilization, Charles Sturt University. In this uh, colloquium, we have really great uh, scholars and Professor Peter Riddle, it is an honor to host you in this colloquium. Thanks for joining and accepting this uh, invitation. Erwan from Indonesia, thanks for accepting this uh, kind invitation for uh, to present in this colloquium. All right, a little bit information about the presenters and uh, titles of uh, this uh, colloquium, a major theme of this colloquium. Then after that, we will start with Peter's presentation. Professor Peter Riddle is Professorial Research Associate in History at School of African and Oriental Studies, University of London, and Senior Research Fellow of the Australian College of Theology. His research focuses on Southeast Asian Islamic history and theological texts with particular reference to interpretation of the Quran. We know uh, Peter is very uh, well known internationally with his studies on early Quran commentary, commentaries uh, in Malay world, Indonesia, Malay world. And recently, uh, Majid and Peter published the Quran in the Malay world uh, by Rotlich uh, publication. And then after Peter, uh, Erwan uh, will, uh, will continue uh, with his presentation. And Erwan Murtawab is a senior lecturer of Quranic, study, uh, Quranic studies at State Institute of Islamic Studies, Metro Lampung, Indonesia. He received doctoral degree from Monash University in 2018 for the thesis title Jalalain, Pedagogical Practice, styles of Quran and tafsir learning in contemporary Indonesia. And Erwan uh, is very familiar with Australia as well. He has done his PhD in Australia and Monash University, Melbourne. Again, thank you so much for joining. What is the main theme? Actually, this uh, colloquium, uh, we thought that this colloquium uh, is held for Australian Journal of Islamic Studies recent special issue on tafsir in the non-Arab Muslim world, volume one and volume two. We published last year and this year two great special issues on tafsir in the non-Arab Muslim world. And Professor Peter Riddle and I uh, have been uh, co-editors of these two special issues. And Erwan also uh, contributed to this special issue. And the main focus of this colloquium uh, main major theme, trends in tafsir Quranic studies in Southeast Asia in the postmodern era. Peter uh, actually will begin with a consideration of the features of postmodernism, then how it differs from modernism, then after that evolving Quranic exegesis in Malaysia and Indonesia in the postmodern world, then after that uh, everyone continue. Please, Peter, uh, yeah, uh, we are looking forward to listening to you and your presentation. Well, thank you very much for that uh, generous introduction, Hakan. And it's um, it's great to be here. I'm very grateful to um, to the centre for in, uh, inviting me to give this. Uh, thank you to uh, Prof Zuleha and uh, Prof Ozalp as well. And uh, thank you to everybody who's attending. I believe we have a very good attendance. Um, the title, um, I've slightly tweaked the title. I've called it Tafsir Responses to Postmodernity in uh, Tafsir in Malaysia. Um, and it seemed to me that as I was thinking about this, um, it was necessary before thinking about Malay the Malaysian context to actually think about postmodernity, where it sits, what it means. Um, and so I'm going to just spend a few minutes do doing that, um, thinking about postmodernity and its responses. Um, the concept of postmodernity um, has has very much emerged from from a consideration and the study of the European intellectual uh, tradition, European the study of European history, and it's very common in European history in thinking about um, periodization of of the periods of European history to to be thinking in terms of pre-modern, modern, 
and postmodern. And pre-modern is often considered to go up to maybe the 1500s or thereabouts. Um, and of course, that inc incorporates the ancient and the medieval or the, the medieval uh, period. Then the modern period is roughly 1500 down to the end of the Second World War, divided into two periods, early modern 1500 to 1800 or roughly, um, and late modern 1800 to 1945, and then post-modernity um, kicks in at the end of the Second World War, 1945, 1950 onwards. Now, of course, the lines are blurry and the periodization is debatable, of course, but that, that, that's quite a useful way of dividing up European history. So that's the context of the title of our talk. Now, what does that mean in terms of, in terms of Islamic history? Um, where, where do we sit with, with that in Islamic history? Well, um, the, um, Dr. Erfan Nurtawab and I, we were recently invited to contribute um, two articles to the Encyclopedia of the Quran online. And I was asked to write about the translation of the Quran into Malay in the pre-modern period. And Dr. Nurtawa was asked to write about the translation of the Quran into Malay in the modern period. So we wrote to the editors and said, what, how do you differentiate between pre-modern and modern? And they said, well, pretty much around the time that the Quran began to be printed, roughly 1900. So that's how we're writing our articles. And so I'm using that periodization uh, on the Islamic side here. So pre-modern up to about 1900, modern from 1900 onwards. And a question that I would ask, which I won't discuss in my talk, we can consider in questions if you want, um, is are those labels, do we need different labels? Because you can see the dysfunction between the use of labels in terms of the European historical tradition and the Islamic historical tradition. And it's very easy to equate Islamic pre-modern with European pre-modern um, in terms of timeline and development and so forth, which I think is, is, is false. Anyway, we're running with the with the with uh, those labels for now. But what's noticeable on the Islamic historical side is an absence of post-modernity. There is a context of post-modernity in the wider world. How is the Islamic world, and especially through Tafsir, responding to post-modernity? That's the question we're asking today. What does it mean? Well, again, going back to the European intellectual tradition, the pre-modernity is typically seen like this. I've got a quote from Gaia here. He says, the pre-modern vision of the world is one of totality, unity, and above all purpose. These values were celebrated in ritual and myth or religious, religious faith. The human self then is an integral part of the sacred whole, which is greater than and more valuable than its parts. Or another quote, ultimate truth could be known and the way to this knowledge is through direct revelation. So if you think of a building with a central pillar like that, that's holding up all the buildings, the pre-modern view in the European historical tradition is the central pillar is God. God holds up, God is the center around which all revolves, God creates, it's a totality and God is at the very center, that's pre-modern in the European sense. In terms of modernity in the European sense, um, again, quoting Gaia, he says, um, the modernity represents a movement from mythos to logos. And this replacement of myth or religion by logic has been going on for a long time. So modernity in terms of the European intellectual tradition is seen as being based on rational reason. Um, reality can be studied and known. Uh, objective rational truth can be discovered through science. Um, this science can lead to ascertaining truth. The yardstick is reason. Truth is demonstrable. And there's a sense of optimism about being able to find out truth. But you note that the central pillar, uh, there's still a building that has structure. It has a central pillar. But now the central pillar is human, human reason and logic. And God has been pushed to the margins or perhaps even pushed off the stage. So that's, that's a common way of seeing pre-modernity and modernity. What about post-modernity? Well, there you have the building has collapsed. Um, modernism versus post-modernism, well, both give prominence to fragmentation 
but in different ways. The modernist features fragmentation in terms of a nostalgia for the past, a nostalgia for when there was order and structure and central pillars. Whereas for the postmodernist, fragmentation is an exhilarating, liberating phenomenon, symptomatic of our escape from the claustrophobic embrace of fixed systems of belief. In other words, the modernist laments fragmentation, sees it as something negative, whereas the postmodernist celebrates fragmentation. Very interesting stuff, really. Um, how do religions respond to this, to postmodernity, to the fragmentation of postmodernity? You know, the, the, the pillar has collapsed, the structure has collapsed. How do religions respond? Well, typically, whether it's Jews or Christians or Muslims, we long to reestablish God as the central pillar. And reason and science is respected, but it's respected as a supplement to, not a replacement for worship of God. And so the religions have this longing to, for God-given order, to reestablish God-given order in place of human postmodernist fragmentation. And postmodernism is not all bad, of course. There have been benefits of postmodernism. Post for example, there's an increasing awareness of diversity, and that, that has triggered activist responses to social problems. For example, the civil rights movement um, has been a been a, a real positive contribution of the postmodernist period. Um, uh, tolerance of difference, becoming an awareness of diversity and more tolerant of difference is a, is a positive um, benefit. Um, and there's a greater interest in the other. But postmodernity has brought harms as well. God is squeezed to the margins or forgotten. Um, and that's a harm for religious people. And I'm a, I'm a, I'm a religious person myself. Um, as, as I assume most, perhaps all of us involved today are. Um, another harm is truth is relative. There's no center. If, if, if truth is relative, namely, I have a truth and you have a truth and he has a truth and they have, she has a truth, they're all different, but they're all true. If that's your way of thinking, there's no center. You've just got the peripheral elements competing. And the other thing with postmodernity is actually Postmodernity is not necessarily as tolerant as it claims because there's a certain intolerance of those who don't buy into the postmodern package. So that's there's some preliminary thoughts about postmodernity. Um, and, and, and really, so what I'm turning my attention to now is to say, well, if that's postmodernity, how are um, exegetes in, in Malaysia are responding to it? Um, what responses are coming. Now, in our audience today, I'm sure we have some people from Southeast Asia, lots of people from Southeast Asia, but I'm sure we also have uh, some people who don't come from Southeast Asia who don't know much about the Malaysian scene. So I'm just going to give you a quick snapshot of the Malaysian scene. And for those of you who are experts on Malaysia, forgive me if I, if I, if I take up this time, but uh, I think it's important just to give a little background. What are some key themes about the Malaysian context that equip uh, a Mufasir to respond to post-modernity. Well, in a sense, Malaysia in one way is a, is a post-modernist dream for a multicultural society. I mean, look at Malaysia. It's two-thirds Muslim, one-third one non-Muslim, so very multi-religious, which is post-modernism, fragmentation, you know, lots of, lots of diversity. Ethnicity, 30 million people are divided into 70% Bumiputra, most of whom are Malays, although there are native tribes in, in Borneo, um, but large numbers of Chinese, Indian, highly multicultural, multi-faith, multi-linguistic, multi multi-ethnic. So that, in a sense, lends itself to post-modernity in terms of diversity, but it also causes, can cause anxiety about identity among the individual groups, as it, as it does in Malaysia. Since Malaysia's independence in 1957, initially as Malaya, then later as Malaysia, um, most of the time, the, the country has been governed by an alliance of different parties representing different racial groups. So the initial alliance consisted of one Malay party, Muslim party, um, UMNO, um, a Chinese party, and an Indian party. So there you have the governing alliance is, is multi-ethnic. Multi but then in opposition 
you had another Malay Islamic party, which is more um, conservative, um, very much more the party that seeks to establish an Islamic state, whereas this Malay Muslim party is more about Islamic values. So you've had you've had combinations of different races there, but also a tension within the uh, Islamic groups about the vision for the Islamic for Islamic society. Constitution is interesting. The 1957 Constitution of Malaya defines a Malay as a person who not only speaks the language and follows customs, but is also a Muslim. So that's a racial ethnic group defined by their religion to some extent. And the 1963 Constitution of Malaya established Islam as the religion of the Federation, but other religions can be practiced. But uh, propagation of non-Muslim religions among Muslims is forbidden by the, by the constitution. So you, you get a sense of diversity, but also a desire to affirm identity to, to within that diversity, not just to have fragmentation, but a desire to affirm identity, Islamic identity, and of course, the other religions as well. Malaysia has had it's a mixed story in terms of its interracial uh, relations. Uh, there were bad riots in 1969, which brought down the government and brought in a new, um, a new, a new alliance of, of, of uh, ethnic parties. Um, then the 1970s in Malaysia, as elsewhere in the Muslim world, brought about a period of Islamic resurgence. Um, and that, um, in a sense, that that emphasized the difference between the two primary Islamic parties, one which was about Islamic values, the other which was about Islamic state. And so this period of Islamic resurgence triggered that and um, brought about a response from the dom dominant govern governing party, which is very interesting. Um, uh, the, the government under Prime Minister Mahathir, again, a multi-ethnic government, nevertheless brought about its own Islamization program in order to um, undermine the influence of the more conservative Islamic opposition. Government um, under Prime Minister Mahathir established new Islamic institutions. And um, so there, there was a, and that caused some friction among the, within Muslim groups, but it also caused some anxiety among non-Muslim groups. So against that, within Malaysia, there have been various attempts by governments to pursue projects which built cohesion in society as well, across the races, across the religions. And one program, which is well known, is called One Malaysia. Another program is called Nagaraku, my, 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 my nation, my state. Um, and so within Malaysia, and I'm leaving Malaysia now to turn to Tafsir, we have, we have this, it's a, it's a fascinating country. It's a, I love Malaysia. It's a very interesting country. Um, you have a series of tensions there. On the one hand, highly multicultural and multi-ethnic, that causes tensions of its own about individual identity. Um, it, it, there has been tension within the Islamic community about different visions for Islamic Malaysia, and there has been tensions between uh, the Muslim and non-Muslim groups as well, and attempts to ad address that by these kinds of programs. So, Having got this, that far, having given you some background, both on post-modernity and on Malaysia, what about Tafsir? How does that work? Well, how, how, do, how do the various Mufassirun respond in Malaysia to the challenges of post-modernity, post-modern fragmentation, diversity, difference, and the challenges of identity? How do they respond? Well, you know, there are lots of Mufassirun in Malaysia, of course. Um, I'm going to choose two just to take selections from their, from their writings and just consider how do they address these kinds of postmodernist themes on the left here. For example, the displacement of God from the center. <coughs> That's part of postmodernism in the West. Um, you know, one of the things that I always appreciate about being in Malaysia is that it's it's easy to talk about God. Um, having religious conversations is something that's quite comfortable, comes naturally. Whereas in the West, often discussions about religious faith are in hushed tones because a lot of people just don't get it. Um, you know, God has, has been pushed out of the center stage in terms of everyday conversations. 
Um, and that displacement of God from the center, how do Malaysian tafsir uh, writers respond to that? Do they comment about that? What about the view that truth is relative, not absolute? This idea that my truth is different from your truth and his truth and her truth, but it's all truth. How do Malaysian or Fasirim respond to that? What about the place of scientific knowledge? You know, under modernism, science became the central pillar. Um, how do Malaysians respond to that? And diversity in the religious other. How do the Fasirim respond to that? So let's, let's move on. Now, um, Dr. Hakan mentioned earlier the recent issues of the Australian Journal of Islamic Studies. And in the issue, volume six, issue four of last year, Dr. Muhammad Nasrin Nasir from the National University of Malaysia, he wrote a very interesting paper called The View of the Other in Modern Malay Exegesis of the Quran. And he analyzed three works of tafsir by Malays. I'm going to take one of the works that he talked about and look at it a little more closely. He reached some very interesting observations in terms of the themes of postmodernism that we're considering. Here's the work, Tafsir Pimpinan Ar-Rahman Kepada Pengantian Al-Quran, which literally means, I suppose, in interpretation of the leadership of, of Ar-Rahman, Ar God, um, towards a, an understanding of the Quran. <coughs> Composed by a Sheikh Abdullah Basmir. Let's talk a little bit about him. He uh, lived in the 20th century, as you can see, died in 1996. He was born in the Hadramaut in Yemen. His family migrated to Malaya when he was about 12 or 13. He experienced some financial hardship in his life and he didn't have an extensive higher education, but he had a lot of informal education, became very erudite, wrote over a dozen works, became a consultant for government on, on various Islamic matters. And among his dozen works were this work of Tafsir, Pimpinan Ar-Rahman. In June of 1963, which is just around the time of the formation of Malaysia, um, the Council of Rulers, which means the Council of the different Sultans of the Malay States, they met and decided to commission a new translation of the Quran. And they engaged Sheikh Basmir to do the translation. Um, now, this came with the blessing of the sultans and also the blessing of government because the project was assigned the, to the prime minister's department. And it remained within that department under four successive prime ministers, beginning with Tunku Abdul Rahman, the first uh, Malaysian prime minister. And this, this work is particularly relevant for our talk today because you see how it's how popular it's been. It's, it appeared <coughs> in Jawi, that's Malay language written in Arabic script, uh, in three volumes in 68, 70, and 72. But from 1980, it appeared in a Romanized edition, which was reprinted in all of those years. So you can see how in much impact it's had. It's a very important work, as Dr. Nasir points out. A little bit about it. Each surah begins with an introduction talking about the name of the surah, the place of its revelation, the numbers of the verses, the essential message of the surah. Dr. Nasir writes that the tafsir is minimal and appears only as footnotes. And it's true. When you read the work, you, you see each, each ayah is a translation of the Arabic of the Quran, but it does have inserted phrases and words to, as a kind of exegetical explanation of certain concepts to which Footnotes are added for some verses. And very importantly, it identifies its audience as the common people. It avoids very complex scholarly language. Sometimes it explains a verse by reference to another verse, which is standard, of course. Sometimes it draws on a hadith, but it doesn't mention the isnad. Um, it sometimes calls on the asbab and nuzul. It doesn't try and explain the mysterious letters. Um, it does talk somewhat about law related verses, but not all. It draws on the Qisas al to some extent. And of course, that's always popular among the masses. But it doesn't talk about matters of grammar, of terra, uh, and so forth. And in that way, the author is clearly, uh, or the Mufassir is clearly aiming to reach the common people. Um, now, let's go back to Dr. Nasir's article. 
very, very interesting because he writes about one of the postmodern themes um, that in an interesting way. You remember that one of the postmodern themes is, is respect for diversity and difference. And in a sense, there's no truth. Everything is true. Everybody's truth is true. Um, and Dr. Nasir, he's somewhat critical of the tafsir because he, he points out its use of the word kafir, um, which he says in Malay language is much more polemical than it is in Arabic. And he says the, the use of the word kafir has potential for triggering animosity and hostility towards, um, towards but non-Muslims in being used in the same way that it's used for the polytheists of Mecca. Um, and he raises an interesting question. He says, the intention of Tafsir Pimpinan Ar-Rahman of making people understand the Quran through the use of simple language, which includes minimal explanation of the exegesis of the verses, <coughs> provides a certain conception that all other religions apart from Islam are in the wrong, if not bordering on Kufr. Interesting comment, isn't it? Um, and it raises a, more, a broader question that um, in writing for the masses, there is a need to keep concepts not too scholarly, not too complicated. And in the process, that can oversimplify the message of the Quran. Um, it's an interesting, interesting thought. So he gives an example. He, quite, he cites the translation of Surah, Surah 3, verse 19, which he translates into English as, surely the religion, surely the religion, and then the, the commentary, which is true and blessed in Allah's sight is Islam. And people, Jews and Christians, it's inserted, who are given the book, do not agree about Islamic religion and are adamant in not accepting it, except after it comes to them, the knowledge about its truthfulness. And he goes on and uses the term kufur and unkar. And this is what Dr. Nasir is critical of. Um, so in a sense, in terms of our topic today, this commentator has responded to the postmodern concept of everything's valid, everything's true, by being quite clear in, in the message that he's giving. So he's rejecting that postmodernist um, pressure, I suppose, to see everything as true. Um, and staying on the same commentary, before I look at the second one, um, if we look at Surah Tul Qiyama, which is Surah 75, verse 3, um, we find several themes here. Again, we have this, this now, of course, this surah is talking about the polytheists. Um, and so the term kafir is used. But also uh, a theme that's coming through here is God's sovereignty. So remember our postmodernist theme of pushing God out of the center? Well, this commentator is reacting against that. He's saying, should people who disbelieve think that we will not be able to gather their bones and bring them back to life? God is sovereign. God can, God can do whatever. And that's the message. So this commentator is reacting against the postmodernist push to see um, to see God as as not involved. Um, here's another within the same uh, Surah Al Qiyamah, um, Surah seventy five, verse five. Um, here again, this he's addressing the concept that truth is relative. Um, he says the truth is not without evidence. Even humans who disbelieve always like to continue their unbelief and immoral actions in their entire life so that they do not acknowledge the day of judgment. Again, truth is clear for him. He's emphasizing that truth is an absolute. That's not a relative, not a relative thing. Uh, similarly, with verse 24, um, <coughs> we have, again, the, the term kafir, and which is the, the, um, the, the, the risk that Dr. Nasir identified in being used for both polytheists and non-Muslims. And given the Malaysian context of a highly um, pluralistic society, a highly multi-ethnic society. This is an issue that that um, it, it would be a matter of concern to to those seeking to build uh, unity. Um, another verse, again, verse thirty-one. Um, the truth, the truth um, is is being emphasised again, and we we find this continuously in this particular commentary that he is, in a sense, he's challenging post the pressure of postmodernism by affirming that truth is not a relative thing. And finally, um, with this commentator, before we look at the, the second one, um, his commentary on Surah Al-Baqarah, verse 16, which talks about 
if they who buy this guidance by leaving guidance, so their business will not prosper and they will not receive guidance. And his footnote is interesting because it's absolutely affirming the sovereignty of God, but also human choice, that delicate balance. Uh, he, 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 his footnote says, Allah compares their situation to people who do business, but do not know the right way of doing business. So such people not only make no profit, they even lose their capital. Their capital in question is the natural, holy and prosperous nature that God gave them to accept his religion and his guidance. Okay, so in summary, with this particular commentator, I think we've got somebody who clearly is, is not buying into the postmodernist package. He's affirming the centrality of God. He is rejecting a diversity that says everything is true. He's affirming truth as an absolute. Um, what about the next second commentator that I want to look at today? Now, this, um, this particular scholar is, um, he comes from the other side of the fence in terms of politics. He, he was the leader, um, the spiritual leader of the Islamic party, the opposition party for which um, the vision was of, a, of, of an Islamic state based on, 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 on all the details of fiqh. Um, um, so that he's coming from a different position. So how does he speak about themes that come from the postmodernist message? Well, let's, these are a couple of his works. Let's just say a little bit about him first. <coughs> he was born in a village near Kodabaru in Kalantan. Um, he did his early studies in Malaya with his father and then with, with others. Um, he then went to India, where he studied in uh, Deoband in the Dar, Darul Ulum. And he then went to Cairo, where he studied at Al Azhar, um, both uh, bachelor and master degrees. So this is obviously somebody who has had a very solid formation in, in, in formal education, and more so than Abdullah Basmir, who we considered earlier. Um, when he returned to Malaysia in 1962, um, he devoted himself to full-time preaching and teaching, um, and he became a, a major name um, as a preacher and teacher before he went into politics. Um, um, but he did go into politics, uh, and he became chief minister for the state of Kelantan. He, he was the uh, spiritual leader, the spiritual model, really, of the Islamic party, and he had a huge career prior to his passing in 2015. It's very significant person in his own right. So how did he, in his writing, how did he talk about those postmodernist themes of, of the religious other, of, of truth, of the place of God, all those postmodernist themes we talked about earlier, how did he, how did he address that? Well, Farish Noor, who's a well-known, very gifted Malaysian scholar, uh, a Malay scholar, um, he wrote that um, Nick Aziz, in his writing, um, he's very much, um, very much affirming the centrality of God. So Farish Noor writes, God is forever present in his writing, and even the kampongs, the villages, and the paddy fields of Kalantan, the state where he came from, remain within the panoptic view of the omniscient God who surveys all that there is to see and know, knows all that there is to know. The vertical axis, it's interesting, like the pillar in my image, the vertical axis connects even the lowliest Kalantanese to God above. So Parish Noor is observing that for Nick Aziz, the Mufasir, God is absolutely central, absolutely central. So that's a rejection of postmodernist pressures. Um, Parish Noor also observes, uh, and I'm just drawing on his writing before we look at an example of Nick Aziz's writings, um, he observes that one point that Nick Aziz never tired of repeating to his audience is the specificity of their own local situation and condition in Kalantan. So Nick Aziz, the Mufasir, he, um, he's not so much a globalist in terms of writing about the whole world. He, 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 his audience, while Malaysian, was especially specifically from Kalantan, from his state. And so there's something very specific about the way he writes about the language that he uses. He's not, very, he's not very generous in his writing about the other faiths. And this, is, this of course, um, has a particular impact on, on the Malaysian context with this multi-faith, multi-ethnic kind of situation. For example, in his Tafsir uh, Surahud, 
He wrote, all the kafirs in the world are evil. There is no such thing as a good kafir, and all the vice that is committed in the world is due to them, the kafirs or the facet. And a question that I, I would want to be asking is, what are the pressures that are causing this kind of writing? Well, I think the pressures would certainly include um, an awareness of being in a multi-faith society, a multi-religious, multi-ethnic society, which causes anxiety about identity, but also world pressures as well, because the writing that we're looking at today were being done at a time that post-modernist post fragmentation was running amok, really, in the Western world. And Malaysia is not immune to that, and it's not uh, ignorant of that either. Um, that's, you know, well visible to everybody in the world. So the pressures of postmodernist fragmentation are a factor, I think, in, in this kind of writing, writing that seeks to reaffirm an identity. What about uh, how does he respond to other things? Well, this was an interesting piece that he wrote uh, in 1998 in the PAS journal, Haraka, the Journal of the Islamic Party. Um, he, wrote, he read it on Miracle of the Night Journey and Ascension based on, on the surah, um, surah 17, verse 1, Surah Al Isra, that famous verse that refers obliquely to the night journey. Um, so, how, what, does he, what does he say? How does he talk about postmodernist themes in this particular talk? Well, um, he affirms the sovereignty of God again. He writes, Although humans are the best of God's creations on this earth, because humans are gifted with reason, Nevertheless, the capacity of human reason is only as much as God has given. So in other words, um, you know, that modernist and postmodernist view that reason is the central pillar for the modernists, and then under fragmentation of postmodernity, still human reason is dominant, is the dominant paradigm. He's rejecting that. He's saying, sure, humans have reason. It makes us the greatest of the creatures, but it's only as much as God gives it to us. So he's affirming the limits of human intellect and the overall sovereignty of God. Um, he get, talks more about this human intellect struggled um, and so forth. That quote is similar um, to the previous one. Um, on the question of science um, and clear guidance, um, he, he, is, um, he is quite clear. So remember, for post-modernity, with fragmentation, you have lack of clarity. You have relative truths. So you have a different view of this and a different view of that, but all views are okay. That's the postmodernist thinking. Nick Aziz, he approaches matters of debate but gives a clear answer. So, for example, he says that there was a debate about the exact date of the ascension of uh, the prophet to, to heaven on the Isra, but he says clearly, um, that the ascension occurred to the prophet before the prophet's hijrah to Medina. So he expresses it in those general terms. He then reports the debate about whether the uh, Isra, during the Isra, um, the ascension was a dream, whether it was just a spiritual thing or whether it was that bodily as well. And again, he gives a clear answer. He's not giving a you know, fragmented, all things are possible. He says almost the entire Islamic Ummah and its religious scholars concur that the prophet's ascension was carried out by God involving both his body and his spirit. What about science? How does he, how does he respond to the place of science? Is science, in his writing, is, is science like it is for the postmodernist and the modernist in, in the West, where it's the central pillar or it's, it encompasses everything? Well, not really. Um, but he doesn't ignore it either. So he takes the story of the ascension, the night journey, and addresses the question of Burak, the famous steed that carried the prophet uh, up, to the, up to the heavens. What was Burak? He asked the question. And he then dabbles in science. He talks about the speed of light. Um, he uses terms such as spacecraft. He, he talks about space shuttles. And he uses uh, his, his commentary as a way of effectively Islamizing science. He explains that Burak was a creature, um, specially created creature for a particular task, a uh, rapid journey to heaven, but it fitted in with the laws of science. And he notes the miracle as the prophet was able to travel at the speed of light without any special clothes. That was his observation. 
And then he finally adds a didactic element to his narrative as well. Um, and he's very clear on right and wrong. Um, he says there are lessons that can be taken from this incident from the night journey, especially for people who are long distance travelers. It's customary to, to make the mosque a stopover place, some stop by just to use the toilet or take a bath to relieve fatigue. Believers who understand the function of the mosque after they have fulfilled all their needs certainly do not forget to pray, whether it is Fardu prayer or Tahiyatul prayer at the mosque. So in other words, he's, he's giving his audience, common people, um, clear guidelines on how they can use something like this for, in their everyday uh, worship activities. So again, um, and so again, I think um, with these, with both of these authors, we have a clear example of um, of people who are writing with giving clear messages, giving clear guide, guidelines. So the fragmentation that we associate with postmodernism, where God has been pushed out of the center, where there is no truth really, or everything is true, um, where diversity dominates. Um, is, is responded to with messages of clarity, with messages of wanting to bring, bring God back into the center. Um, and uh, it's quite clear. Now, I've used these two um, as, as examples um, for, for what I've found, but this is work in progress and there's more work to be done. And I think with that, I shall leave it and conclude. So thank you very much. Uh, Professor Peter Dahl, thank you so much. I think uh, great presentation, very interesting. Uh, findings uh, and summer of modernity, postmodernity, then and uh, some parts from two tafsir to tafsir. I think I think it looks very interesting. Before everyone maybe uh, Q, Q &A, question and answer session, we should get we can get we can have some questions. Uh, all right, uh, if you have any questions, please you know feel free to ask uh, Peter. Uh, you can either raise your hand or maybe you can write on chat box, all right? You can type on chat box. We have chat box as well. Please go ahead. Any questions? Professor uh, yes. Saleh. Yes, Sali. Yes. Well, Professor thank you, Saleh. Peter, uh, for that presentation. Personally, although I read many texts, but not uh, the one in Asia, particularly in Malaysia and Indonesia, uh, I have a question. Uh, my question is, uh, what was the reaction of other professors uh, about uh, Dr. Nasser's understanding of the expression of kafir? Um, I think it's too early to say. Um, I haven't, I haven't um, seen any, any particular reactions to that. That said, um, that's probably a question for Dr. Nasser, actually. Um, so uh, I, I really can't respond to, a good, to that very good question. I'm sorry. No worries. Thank you. Uh, all right. Thank you, Professor Sali. Any any other questions, uh, please? Uh, yes, Muri. Hello, Dr. Uh, Professor Peter. How are you? Hi. Nice to, nice to meet you. Um, my question is: Now um, you frame this uh, the discussion with regards to postmodernism, which has uh, the, 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 the main theme as relative truth or um, uh, what do you call it, uh, 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 ethical subjectivism, we call it as well. But um, in our tradition, Mu'tazila also had these ideas from the beginning like Mu'tazila had all these ideas of postmodernism and even modernism, but uh, you didn't mention anything about it. Like within the tradition also, this uh, relativism and objectivism is there. Okay, look, uh, sorry, have you finished? Yeah, yeah, yes, please, Peter. Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. Um, no, I didn't, I didn't address the Mu'tazila. Um, and now that's an interesting suggestion, isn't it? I mean, certainly the Mu'tazila definitely had elements of relativism about them. There's no doubt about that. Um, you know, they, the concept of uh, freedom of choice and so forth was, was, was a key idea that you can, where you can draw a parallel with postmodernist ideas. But of course, I used, I used European postmodernism as, as my point of reference. And that goes much further than the Mu'tazila, doesn't it? I mean, the Mu'tazila writers yes. never, never at any stage suggested that, that, that God was invisible, you know, that, that, that the really 
uh, science was, was the answer. Um, I think for me, more Tozila and, and the, the European postmodernist understanding are quite significantly different. There may be certain touch points, but I think uh, it goes much, much further. I, Peter, I agree with you. Just a little comment, definitely. Uh, I agree with you. You know, there is huge difference. Mu'tazile, actually, they say that even, uh, you know, revelation doesn't come. People are responsible to believe in one God by reason. They say that reason has, you know, has more, you know, has a priority over even revelation and reason can access to absolute truth. They argue, you know, Postmodernity, very new phenomenon. Uh, yeah, there can there can be some parallels uh, in approach, but uh, completely the new phenomenon. This postmodernity, uh, but very interesting question, Murray. Thank you. Uh, any Thank other you. Com any other questions? Any other comments? Questions? Uh, Peter, if I ask you questions or two tafsirs you focused on. Uh, but one scholar studied in Azhar, other one uh, looks more local. I think, uh, yes, you uh, compare their approaches uh, in the light of postmodernity, postmodern uh, principles. Uh, I, I think I believe that scholars actually who go to Europe or studied in Europe, uh, Quran commentators actually, intellectuals, uh, Muslim intellectuals, Quran commentators, who traveled to Europe or somehow engaged with European thought or modern thought or studied, I think they uh, they might have more uh, engagement uh, with these uh, ideas, modern ideas or postmodernity. Uh, yes, their minds are clear, these two scholars, but uh, I am not sure to what extent their knowledge of uh, these modern uh, modernity, postmodernity. I'm not sure you know, about their uh, intellectual knowledge about these uh, tendencies. Yeah. yeah. As I come, what do you think? Do they do you think uh, do they have particularly respond to uh, these uh, ideas, postmodernity or modern modernity or West or modern science? Or, or do they say directly or uh, based on their writings, uh, there is clear opposition? Yeah, um, I, I think their 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 response is more related to their own particular context, Hakan. Um, so neither of the scholars, as you observed, actually neither of the scholars went and studied in the European context. So they haven't actually swum in the ocean of European post postmodernist thinking. Um, but Malaysia is a, is a sort of, in a sense, it's a sort of fascinating melting pot in so many ways of ethnicity, of religion, of culture, of of, of, of language of all different kinds of things and that in itself tr can trigger certain postmodernist type conversations or certainly it can uh, be accessible to pressures from outside I so see. the mm. two scholars i've looked at are responding to their own context and wanting to affirm certainty within their own context but no they're not as far as i've seen i haven't seen either of them write directly against the um, European writings. I see. But you say that their context, because Malaysia is very multicultural, their context uh, might be an opportunity for them, maybe to gauge, engage more uh, than other states, maybe, their context. Yes, yes I think so. And, and Malaysia is sort of, um, um, you know, highly multicultural, multi-ethnic, multi-religious, multi-linguistic context um, is a cause of, well, in some ways, it's a cause of celebration, but it's also a cause of anxiety, anxiety for identity for all groups. Um, and we, we, we've seen that in terms of the, uh, the tussle for Islamic identity between the different uh, Islamic parties, for example. And that tussle has caused anxiety among the non-Islamic communities as well. Um, so I see parallels between the, the anxiety that one finds with fragmentation in the West, which I see with my own eyes living in the West, and some of the anxiety that one sees in Malaysia because it is so diverse. Um, and, and yeah, they're, they're the parallels. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Uh, any other questions? Any other, uh, any other uh, contribution, maybe comments? Just, it just, it came to my mind, very brief comment. Uh, Muri, you asked a very interesting question. It came to my mind uh, if in the Greek, 
philosophy in the Greek philosophy there there was a group called Sophistis you know and kalam kalam is literature kalam books actually mention and Sophistis believe that truth cannot be known you know true truth cannot be known and theologians you know, in their theological writings harshly criticize Sophistis and they put uh, you know as a response to Sophistis at the beginning of any kalam text they say you know, realities of things uh, are known, can be known and are, ex you know, they exist. You know, realities of things exist. Yes, so like Sophista is, uh, we see some similar patterns maybe in Greek philosophy, but I think postmodernity had more than just uh, these, uh, just only some aspects possible that yeah very new phenomenon any questions or any comments any questions to peter or any comments all right uh, peter thank you so much i think uh, great presentation and very interesting of course it is recorded now we will uh, after the work workshop after the colloquium we will upload it on interact site we will share it and uh, public publicly and academically it will be of course, uh, it will it will be available and definitely uh, it will be very helpful uh, for the academia. Now, after Peter, but still, if you have any questions, comments, you can type on chat box. Peter can answer maybe after Ervan's presentation. Still, uh, discussion can go on. Yes, Ervan, please now your turn. Go ahead uh, with your presentation. Let's have a look. Let's see <clears throat> Indonesian perspective. Uh, uh, I see, I remember uh, there are some names in, in, in Indonesia. Uh, Yehuda, well, I forgot his name. Uh, th there are some very interesting intellectuals from uh, in the Indonesian context. Wahidun, yeah, yeah, please. Okay, thank you very much. Is my voice clear? Okay. Yes, yes, clear. Okay, yes. thank you very much. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. Thank you very much. Uh, um, today, uh, I'm very honored to be here talking about trends in software of chronic studies in the Indonesian context. Um, the term Indonesia here not only refers to the name of its national language, but the term Indonesia also includes uh, its diversities uh, in cultures, languages, and writing tradition. So, um, in this moment, uh, I would like to thank Dr. Hakan Koru, a great college of mine, who kindly became the host for my talk with Peter Riedel, and to the Center of Islamic Studies and Civilization of Charles Sturt University of Australia for a great uh, initiative in organizing this meeting. And I should add uh, Professor Peter Riddell, a great college of mine and my great mentor uh, as well. Uh, I have really experienced uh, a great time with Peter Riddell, especially during my stay in Melbourne uh, for my PhD program at Monash University under the supervision of uh, uh, Professor Julian Milley. Um, in the first session, which is very interesting and, and uh, stimulating, uh, Professor Peter Riddell already explained a theoretical uh, discussion of modernism versus postmodernism and how this theoretical frame can be useful to understand the Quranic exegetical, exegetical practices or activities in each period of time, especially in the postmodern era. Um, as we can see, uh, scholars and philosophers have uh, different views in observing the, the postmodern era, but uh, then they tend to be agreeable in seeing these situations uh, in this period uh, by the emergence of uh, skepticism uh, toward uh, the great narratives of uh, modernism and to some extent being opposed to the stability of meaning. So, uh, the postmodern outlook is commonly uh, characterized by epistemological uh, relativism and in some ways uh, rejects uh, the so-called uh, universal validity 
of uh, of a bit of a uh, uh, binary oppositions. Um, but anyway, uh, in the context of my presentation today, I don't intend to precisely analyze the grid wave of postmodernism and connected global movement or thought uh, to the Quranic ascetical practices in the Indonesian context. Uh, however, uh, we are at least uh, agreeable with the fact that uh, what we mean with the postmodern era is is uh, simply the continuation of the modern era itself. Then we hope that we are able to uh, estimate uh, when the postmodern era started in the context of the Indonesian uh, Quranic executive activities and whose Quranic commentary or commentaries can be regarded as representative. Um, I think uh, in our attempts at uh, understanding the uh, early modern period of the Indonesian Quran commentary traditions, um, it is uh, very valuable to uh, to take into account from uh, Professor Joanna Pink. Uh, here, uh, Joanna Pink emphasized two uh, important developments uh, that happened during the 19th century that greatly influenced the the increase of the Quranic ascetical activities exponentially uh, in the uh, Muslim world, and this is also the case with the uh, with uh, those developed in in the Indonesian regions. Nineteenth um, century uh, Indonesia, especially in the uh, in the mid of nineteenth century, witnessed the use of uh, print machines for the publication of Islamic books, especially the Quran, and the emergence of non-religious schools in Java for among the Europeans and Japanese Priyai families. And among them, some students were identified as Muslims, and there were an increasing need for printed books to serve uh, the purpose of studying Islam, which correspond to their ways of living. Um, personally, uh, Professor Johanna's explanation on the, on, the uh, on the emphasis of the printing machines and non-religious schooling in Indonesia doesn't mean that she negates the fact that uh, modern tafsir are very much connected to the emergence of reformist modernist movement of the 19th and early 20th century, uh, greatly influenced by the Egyptian scholars Muhammad Abdu and Rashid Rido, and by the uh, Islamic, uh, Islamic modernist reformist link established in the Indian and uh, Pakistani regions. So, uh, through this links of reformist modernist movements, uh, Southeast Asian, especially Indonesian Muslims, uh, received uh, modern, uh, modern values in their social life since the late 19th century and reached its peaks in the first half of the uh, 20th century. Especially with the link of the Indian and, and uh, Pakistani scholars, uh, the early 20th century Indonesia witnessed uh, the great reception of Quran commentaries carried out by those affiliated with the Ahmadi uh, movement. Aside from that, uh, trends in modern tafsir writing you know, automatically replaced the pre-modern ascetic activities that were so heavily influenced by the uh, tafsir al-Jalalain. Uh, tafsir Jalalain uh, still received uh, uh, its reception, uh, being translated and 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 commented uh, on uh, in local languages and continued to be used in both present, traditional, and modern uh, educational milieu. Um, there are some features uh, for us to, uh, to understand modern Quranic ascetical traditions. Firstly, uh, this uh, period witnessed use of the words Jema and Tafsir that in some ways still refer to the same domains in in in, in interpretation of the Quran. Uh, in other words, Jema and Tafsir were interchangeably used to refer the uh, uh, the, the same exegetical activities. Secondly, uh, the um, vernacularization of the Quran uh, started to emerge in the 19th century. So in this regard, 
we are confident to propose a few decades earlier than uh, Benjamin Zimmer's statement, which proposed the 20th century as the starting point where the Quran has been translated into many uh, major languages of Southeast Asia. So, during the 19th century, uh, the evidence shows us that uh, some Quran translation in Japanese, Burkinese, and uh, Sundanese uh, were produced, although uh, many of them uh, are found incomplete. Then uh, the Quran commentary receive uh, some elements in modern or Western styles, both its physical aspect and its substance. Next, uh, especially after the 19th uh, century, we witness the more dominant uh, the more domination in the use of Roman script and national language among the Indonesian publics. Then uh, modern translation or commentary can be seen from the efforts of its author be more friendly with the grammatical system of the target language. Um, layout follows functions. Yes, uh, we can see that the layout of the printed modern Quran commentaries uh, tend to be more similar to the biblical printing because uh, they, they use the same technology. Then the commentator try to make a uh, translation as equivalent as possible where they put additional explanation in the footnote as its commentary. And last but not least, uh, but not the least, uh, quoting biblical verses. Uh, some modernist Quran commentaries are identified to quote uh, biblical verses to support their Quran commentaries. And yeah, this is the uh, Quran Arabic translation and, and its footnote commentary as seen in the Zainuddin Hamadi, uh, Zainuddin Hamidi's Tafsir Quran. Um, then, what commentaries did scholars identify to belong to the modern era? Uh, in his attempt at listing the modern commentaries, uh, Howard Fiedespiel included some works as belonging to the first group of commentaries produced in the modern Southeast Asia, and that all of them were produced in the 19th century. Uh, for example, Mahmud Yunus Tafsir Quran, Abdul Halim Hassan Tafsir Al Quran and also Zainuddin Hamidi Tafsir Al Quran. Um, these commentaries certainly corresponds to the character of modern exegetical activities. Um, but if this classification belongs uh, to those works written in Indonesian lang languages, uh, it can be right. But if the theme of classifying Quranic works accommodate works in other major languages in the Indonesian regions, we uh, certainly propose another way of explaining trends of modernized Quranic psychological activities. So, um, in response to Fiederspiel's categorizations, I can say in a high level of certainty that uh, the root uh, of modernism in Indonesian Quran uh, psychological activities can be traced back earlier, uh, that is, since the mid of the 19th century. We have at least uh, two evidence to support this statement. Uh, the first one is the, the printed Japanese Quran by the Link Company uh, in 1858, and Japanese Quran carried out by Bagus Narpa, or royal servant at the early uh, 20th century Japanese court of uh, Surakarta. Um, the uh, printed Japanese Quran by Leng Company. Uh, I think uh, has some important points. Uh, this is the, the first printed work of Quran, Quran, uh, Quran translation in Java, or even in, in Southeast Asian regions, if we refer to the fact that the printed Quran commentary in Malay, Juman al Mustafid, just firstly appeared. Uh, I mean, the yeah, the printed Quran commentary in Malay, Juman al Mustafid, uh, yeah, just firstly appeared in in 1884, if I'm mistaken, uh, in, in, in Istanbul. And the second one is uh, the targeted readers of this printed Quran were not the students who stay and studied Islam in the Japanese Pesantra in the countryside, that over styles of Islamic learning using the Arabic letter based modified scripts called Kegon. Instead, uh, the publisher uh, more 
probably targeted the staff of the colonial tradition. Uh, I mean, sorry, the, uh, the, the staff of the colonial administrations. And, and they also targeted the students and teachers at modernized westernized schools, especially in the milieu of Japanese courts as their pedagogical tools in uh, studying Islam. And the second evidence is Bagus Ngarpa's early 20th century Japanese Quran. Uh, it is clearly stated uh, in its cover, the intention of producing this work is to serve the purpose of the Waradharma circle to study Islam and to have more direct approach to the Quran. Um, yeah, this is the, the cover of Ngarpa's Japanese Quran and a page of printed Japanese Quran by the Ling company that can guide us to understand that the the root of modernism in the Quranic exegetical practice it can can uh, can be traced back earlier in the 19th century. Um, assume which year tens of Indonesian tafsir entered the modern era. Uh, the the answer for this question. Uh, certainly will be different among the scholars. Uh, this is due to the fact that the, periodiz the periodization of human history after the modern era can always be open discussions. So uh, in our attempt at determining the, uh, the point where the Indonesian tafsir entered the postmodern, yeah, I propose the second half of the 1950s is the period where a few Indonesian commentators seems to have played the role as the postmodernist com Quran commentators. So the role is uh, uh, the post uh, postmodern era is uh, uh, is is simply the continuation of the uh, the modern era, as I uh, stated before. Uh, one example is the uh, Hasbi Asidiki's Quran commentary. Uh, I'm sorry, I uh, I don't provide the English translation for us, uh, for the. Acid uh, statement here. So some reasons why Acid Biki can be regarded the pioneer of the postmodernist thinker here. First, uh, he criticized works on Islamic studies by Western scholars or Orientalists here. Uh, for Acid Biki, buku-buku uh, tafsir yang ditulis dalam bahasa Barat tak dapat kita jamin kebersihannya dan kesesuaian jiwanya dengan ketinggian dan kemurnian jiwa Islam. So here, uh, he he criticized works uh, on Islamic studies by uh, Orientalists. Uh, for Asid Biki, Islamic thought as articulated by Western scholars was subject to further investigation because uh, the perspective they developed were based on was a nice scientific point of view, not the correct Akida. And the second one is uh, he also provided some short reviews, but very critical uh, toward current publication on the Quran commentaries by uh, made by his contemporaries. Uh, tafsir tafsir yang telah ada dalam masyarakat Indonesia sejak beberapa lama, Amsal tafsir by Dawi tidak selaras lagi dengan perkembangan bahasa dan tata bahasa Indonesia. Tafsir Muhammad Yunus mengandung kekeliruan. Tafsir Abdul Halim sekiranya telah sempurna. Tafsir Persatuan Islam suatu tafsir yang ringkas bahkan terbaik. Um, yeah, he provided some short reviews here. He criticized Muhammad Yunus' commentary as containing some errors in translations, but he applauds, uh, appreciates, uh, appreciated Abdul Halim work as the perfect one. Besides, uh, as Siddiqui commented on the Quran commentary by Ahasan, the founder of the reformist modernist Muslim Union as the best Quran commentary. Um, yeah, uh, there would be a long uh, explanation for this slide, and uh, the slide is short. Uh, apologies for that. Um, let any uh, century and 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 early 21st century Indonesia witnessed an increasing number of what Feeders feel called enriched uh, commentaries. 
pioneered by the launch of the three full commentaries uh, Tafsir Quran Al Majid An Nur by Asidiki that I mentioned before, Tafsir Al Azhar by Hamka, and a, a volume commentary by a team from the Indonesian Ministry of Religious Affairs. The development of a specifically Indonesian uh, modern or postmodern hermetic can be seen in attempts uh, to address uh, yeah, some issues here yeah. the Quran and science, uh, feminist or gender studies, and relation between Islam and, and statehood or citizenship. More recently, Indonesian Muslims also witnessed increasing exegetical activity website and social media so we we start from the uh, yeah scientific quranic commentaries here uh, out after ilmi uh, trends in quranic uh, scientific interpretation can be seen from the translation of uh, professor maurice bushell's la bible like quran at uh, uh, the, the 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 bible the quran and the science uh, by uh, professor rashidi a renowned uh, Indonesian intellectual graduate from the Sorbonne University. The book first, uh, I mean, the uh, the translation was appeared in 1978, and and the book uh, gained uh, a fair degree of popularity. And from the 1980s, the 1990s, two Indonesian scholars. Nazwar Shamsu and Ahmad Baikuni also uh, gained uh, popularity through their published works on the Quran and science. Another important work belonging to this category is the proceeding of the International uh, Conference on the Miracles of the Quran and Prophetic Tradition on Modern Science and Technology. Um, Muslim intellectuals from 15th centuries, uh, including Maurice Bushell, contributed papers uh, in this conference, but I'm not sure whether he also attended the conference. And then the uh, the, uh, the collection of papers were published uh, by the famous Indonesian Islamic publisher, Gemma Insani Press, in two volumes in 1995. Despite uh, this, uh, the uh, uh, decreasing trends in, uh, during the, uh, uh, the first decade of the the first century, the second decade of the 21st century in Indonesia witnessed significant attempts at bowing open a scientific perspective in Quranic exegetical activity. So uh, the government efforts in upgrading the organizational status of some state institute of Islamic studies, UIN, UIN where, where my, I myself uh, best best in this uh, university. Uh, yeah, upgrading the organizational status uh, from YN into uh, state Islamic universities in the early 2000s. Uh, this effort has attracted more Muslim scholars' attention to the integration of uh, religious studies and sciences in the Islamic university curricula. For example, uh, the government, through the Committee for Correction of the Quran Manuscript, Lajna Pantashih and Mushaf Al Quran, or LPMQ, of the Ministry of Religious Affairs, in collaboration with the Indonesian Institute of Sciences, Lembaga Ilmu Pengetahuan Indonesia, or LIPI, also launched studies of Quranic uh, scientific commentaries that are accessible online in their official website. Aside from that, there is also the individual effort by Professor Agus Purwanto, a Muhammadiyah organization member who was granted a doctoral degree in physics from Hiroshima University in 2002 to approach Quran and the prophetic tradition through his expertise in science, especially in physics. He published several books on related subjects, especially those with Mizan publisher. He also initiated formation of Islamic high schools that he calls trend science, abbreviated from Sun Trend Science, uh, the Islamic Boarding School of Sciences. Um, with regard to the gender studies best commentary writing, 
a trend has developed uh, i think since since the 1990s especially through the formation of the ngo speciali specialization in women issues figures deserve mention here are kai hussein muhammad and his disciple uh, men uh, students fakihuddin abdul qadir abdul qadir developed a method that he calls kiroah mubadalah gender relation based reading he, uh, his suggestion to consider gender relations in looking at religious texts has attracted a wide audience among the scholarly uh, faculty of islamic higher educational institution and muslim groups especially those affiliated with the nahdlatul ulama organization um, in addition some scholars have addressed gender studies in doctoral research such as professor nasaruddin umar in 1998 in UIN Sharif Wilayah Jakarta and that the development of the genre was also endorsed by projects translating works of prominent feminist scholars like Amina Wadud be reading the sacred text from a women's uh, perspective uh, and also professor Asma Barlas believing women in Islam and reading uh, patriarchal interpretation of the Quran. Regarding the discourse on Islam and uh, statehood or Islamic moderation, uh, scholars deserving mentions are uh, first of all is Professor Dukholis Majid, Quraysh Shihab, and also the later uh, generation is uh, Professor Abdul Mustaqim. Um, the following analysis shows how Nurhalis Majid's thought on new modernism and pluralism uh, stimulated debates among Muslims and were in line with the uh, new order governments attempt to promote uh, religious values that supported uh, government developmental policies and ethnic differences. So some of his important contemporaries uh, dedicated to providing uh, more rational and cultural Islam into the Indonesian publics we mentioned here are uh, Professor Harun Nasution and Dawam Raharjo, uh, Professor Ahmad Shafi Marif, uh, who just passed away uh, a month ago, and many others. Meanwhile, uh, Professor Muhammad Quraysh Shihab should be a, uh, should be given a privilege as in Indonesian modern Quranic exegesis, uh, granted a doctoral degree in Quranic exegesis from Al Azhar University in about 1982, Rashihab soon became an iconic figure in this discipline. Since the 1980s, his works have attracted a wide readership among Indonesian Muslims, especially those who live in urban areas. His Quranic understanding uh, generally aims to motivate Muslims and more recently to support moderations. While he regularly produced works on thematic interpretation and economic sciences, he then decided to prepare a commentary on the whole Quran, being the title Tafsir Misbah, or The Interpretation of the Light. Its first volume appeared in 2000, and the entire work was published in 2017. A more recent name worthy of mention here is the later generation of Indonesian Islamic scholars, Abdul Mustaqim of Yogyakarta. Uh, John Aping mentioned uh, Mustaqim's attempt to provide a friendly visual dimension for children in commentary. Uh, however, he is also known for his innovative Quranic interpretive method that he calls uh, Tafsir Makosidi or propulsive readings. Although also some other Indonesian scholars uh, uh, develop uh, this kind of uh, Quranic uh, uh, commentary. Uh, some of the aforementioned figures uh, also use YouTube and social media to gain a wider audience. Precious uh, lectures, for, for example, were generally uploaded to YouTube. It is also worth mentioning Nadisha Hussein, uh, who once uh, regularly wrote short articles on Quran commentary on his uh, Facebook and uh, Twitter. Many of his online writings are then compiled. Uh, and publish uh, 
with the title uh, Sur Quran in the social media uh, in the uh, in the uh, Indonesian language. Um, the current state of uh, Quranic studies development shows an interesting uh, dynamic. The current Indonesian Muslim public uh, witnessed the shifting paradigm among the Islamic scholars based in some Islamic school, uh, uh, some Islamic university in looking at the scripture as the source of uh, Islamic religions. Uh, this is what uh, Professor David Fishanov called as uh, anthropological turn. Uh, that is uh, the shift uh, in modern Christian thought that has turned theology into anthropology. Uh, corresponds to what is similar that has that has been happening in uh, Quranic interpretations. So the questions: What does eternal God mean to convey through this Quranic verse? Uh, becomes uh, changed. Become uh, the questions: uh, What meaning my uh, 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 historically and culturally located human being construct uh, out of the uh, out of the so uh, the I mean the current uh, commentators belonging to this uh, group are always uh, focus on interpretation of the Quran on humanity rather than God. Those who advocate this kind of perspective are mostly our our beloved colleagues, mentors, and experts in Quran studies. Uh, some that can be mentioned here are, for example. Uh, Professor Amin Abdullah, Professor Aksin Wijaya, Professor uh, Yudin Wahyudi, and Professor Shairan Samsudin from the link of the Jakarta Islamic Scholarship. As for the Jakarta Islamic Scholarship link, uh, some of them can, can be mentioned here are Professor Komarudin Hidayat and scholars affiliated with the Parabadina University School of Thought. Um, I think uh, it is almost impossible to end this presentation with an adequate, uh, comprehensive conclusion since this presentation cannot representatively cover all complexities in the development of uh, modern and postmodern Quranic executive activities in the Indonesian regions. And I guess uh, the study of Quran in response to uh, postmodernism, uh, yeah, uh, following the Professor Peter Riddle's presentation, I think it is more advanced in the Malaysian context rather than in the, in the Indonesian context. Um, of course, uh, yeah, in the following decades, globalization quick maintaining their hegemonic influence uh, on the Muslim social life and how they should read the scripture in their public spheres. One thing for sure, the Quranic exegetical activities will, uh, will develop during the, the 21st century, and that the, the emphasis on humanity and emancipation values more increasingly become the basis in scholars' attempts at understanding the Quranic verses. At the same time, this mainstream in Quranic interpretation will certainly receive challenges from the more conservative Muslim group. And last but not least, hopefully there would be some participants here, especially from the Indonesian audience, who show their great interest to formulate the research project for MA or PhD, which aims at understanding the complexity of the postmodern Muslim societies uh, in Indonesian context, especially in connection with the ways in which they uh, position the Quran as their response uh, to the current global values. Uh, thank you very much, Hakan. Okay. Okay. Erwa, thank you so much. Thank you. Very, uh, very interesting. Uh, as Peter's presentation, very interesting. Uh, thank you for your great presentation. Now, uh, we can have some questions. Uh, Dr. Mustafa typed on chat box. Uh, he, he's asking, the commentator as Mufassir in the South Asia are men. A little of them are women commentator. Uh, commentators, what can be explained the history of Tafsir, then Mufassir in South Asia, the point of view from men and women proportions commentator? Yes, Erwan, what do you think? Yes, yeah. yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I think uh, 
statement from uh, Dr. Mustafa Kamal is in is uh, is entirely correct, and I agree with that. Uh, yeah, I think this is also the problem of uh, publications. Uh, yeah, yeah. Actually, there are some some uh, some women scholars uh, who are not included here. Uh, we have, uh, for, uh, for example, Professor uh, Musda Mulia, and also uh, uh, one professor from uh, Yogyakarta Islamic Scholarship Link, uh, Ali Matul Kipia. And also my colleague uh, Julianti Mutmainna, uh, she is, uh, I think, the, one of the best young scholars who uh, uh, who try to uh, to revisit the, uh, the concept of the mustahik uh, uh, in uh, in the in the distribution of zakat uh, in the Islamic uh, 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 jurisprudence. I think this is one of the uh, good examples understand that uh, some women commentators also play important role uh, in uh, in providing a new ways of understanding the Quran. So uh, specifically, I would like to uh, to uh, give the point uh, uh, the contribution of my colleague uh, Julian Timut Maina. Uh, she is uh, she is uh, uh, she has uh, dedicated. Uh, to, uh, to providing some uh, basis, a uh, legal basis, uh, uh, for uh, uh, for women who who suffer from, uh, I mean, uh, uh, who has been victimized, uh, korban uh, kekerasan, yeah. uh, women who has been victimized should receive uh, zakat, as uh, should. Uh, uh, get more attention from the uh, government, especially from the uh, philanthropy organization. So this kind of uh, effort in in uh, in revisiting the uh, established Islamic jurisprudence can be regarded as one of the uh, uh, effort uh, uh, from the uh, uh, women uh, women commentator uh, provide uh, mm -hmm. a new ways of understanding the Quran. Yes, uh, yeah, I agree with uh, with uh, Mustafa Kamal's statement, but I think this is also the problem of publications. So okay. yeah, we mean, uh, men are still more powerful, uh, but I don't know uh, for sure. But, uh, maybe oh, Prof. Oh, Peter Riddell has uh, some... Uh, good, good point, Erwan. Of course, men uh, are powerful everywhere, you know, in, pub, you know, in politics, everywhere. And, but as you said, uh, women's voice actually is very crucial. Muslim uh, women scholars' uh, points of view. Now we live in a very different world. As you said, uh, Peter provided char some characteristic postmodern world uh, compared to medieval period, classical period, and how to engage constructively uh, with the, uh, with this today's society. You know, understanding uh, the world in which we live is very crucial uh, in uh, interpreting the Quran as well, in understanding Islam in today's context. Uh, first, uh, yes, Professor, yes, uh, Prof uh, yes, Peter, before uh, Saad, Professor Saad and Marie, yes? Oh, yes, just, just to give a, a response to that question that was posted about women's interpretation. A uh, yeah, good question, I agree with uh, Irvan, um, that the question, uh, the, the, the question is, is correct, that there, there obviously, when you consider the the sweep of um, history of tafsir writing, um, both vertically and horizontally, yes, it's been dominated by men. Um, clearly, um, there are, of course, there in the modern day, um, there are women who are involved in different ways in writing comment on, on the Quran. Um, uh, but of course, I guess the question is, to what extent are they responding to postmodernist pushes? And part of the postmodernist movement, as, as I was discussing at the beginning of, beginning of my lecture, was 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 laying down challenges to the status quo. And of course, the feminist postmodernist challenge, um, in broad terms, is very much challenging uh, patriarchy and uh, male dominance. So, what's happening in Southeast Asia? Everyone gave a very good good response there. I thought, in terms of Malaysia, um, of course, there are there are women scholars who are 
in their scholarship, they're doing some commentary writing in, in bits and pieces. Um, but, but who is writing tafsir or engaging in tafsir-like activities in a way which is really challenging the status quo? Well, here I think the, the group Sisters in Islam in Malaysia, for example, uh, and what they have done is um, they have taken um, Amina Wadud's um, interesting commentary on the Quran from a feminist perspective and Amina Wadud's attempt to reinterpret certain Quran verses in a way that are that are more sensitive to, to women's perspective. The Sisters in Islam has drawn on that as inspiration for their own work. They do some interesting work in Southeast, in, in Malaysia, because um, they, they um, discreetly and diplomatically um, challenge very conservative interpretations of certain verses with their own um, you know, alternative interpretation. So that's tafsir. So they are doing tafsir and it's challenging tafsir. Um, but there's a long way to go. And I think the question is, is correct, that clearly it's male dominated at this stage. We're seeing early signs of, uh, of more postmodernist kind of challenges to, to patriarchy, but there's, there's much more to happen there. Peter, thank you so much for your great contribution. Thank you for reminding me, Sisters in Islam and Musawa, Equality Movement. These are very influential in Malaysia. And I, I use some of their publications for my subject. Yes, Professor Sali, then after that, Nuri. Yes, well, uh, thank you so much, Aaron, for your presentation. Uh, again, forgive my ignorance. My question is about uh, the influence of Hikayat and uh, Tasawuf on uh, in modern tafsirs or postmodern tafsirs. Uh, is there any influence, or totally they just see them as not academic? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Professor Muri Hassan. Yeah, this is this is very very uh, wonderful question. I think. Uh, yeah, this is also my question. Why 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 Sufi commentaries? Uh, it's not really popular in the uh, yeah in the modern era. Why uh, commentaries? Uh, yeah, maybe maybe yeah they just regard it as an uh, uh, as an academic. Yes, as uh, as far as I'm. Uh, I'm concerned. Yeah, there is a little learn about the development of the Sufi commentaries uh, in the Indian context uh, in the modern era, and also the the the, the, uh, the role of hikayat that play very important important role uh, in the classical Malay literature. Uh, also include the in uh, uh, Indonesian regions. I uh, I. I can see uh, this kind of uh, these two genres uh, also play a significant role uh, in the uh, in the Indonesian context, especially in the modern era. But I think it's yeah, I think it is it is more interesting to know more about this. And yeah, so far I don't have any specific uh, yeah. Uh, answer for this and thank you very much professor Muriasan, for this sorry, wonderful pro question sorry professor sali yes professor sali thank you so much uh, uh, sorry yeah for this yes uh, muri do you want to quit any yes. hello dr Erwin. my first question is um what's the impact of fazul rahman as a uh, exeget in in indonesian context because uh, there is Pretty much, uh, Fazul Rahman is the man when we talk about modernist interpretation of the Quran. All the feminists go back to him in his, uh, if, you, if you must be knowing, the contextualist approach to exegesis. I have another question, uh, sir, if you don't mind. Uh, my second question is, now we have identified that there are uh, modernist Muslims and something called a modernist Islam. Do you recognize... That, uh, that there is something called postmodernist Islam that is that is that can be distinguished from modernist Islam. Thank I you. Think, yeah, yeah. Mori, I think these are very great questions. Yes, Erwan. Thank yeah, you. thank you very much. Yeah, uh, as I sent it, uh, yeah, uh, there is a so-called the development of uh, neo modernism in the Indonesian context, especially uh, it has uh, developed since the 1970s. Uh, we have, uh, yeah, at least we have two, uh, two scholars 
uh, who received influence from the Fadur Rahman's uh, scholarship. Uh, the first one is the Professor Nurfalis Majid, and the second one is the Buya Ahmad Shafi Maris, who just passed away uh, a month ago. Uh, yeah, uh, Fadur Rahman. Uh, yeah, as uh, as we know, uh, Fadur Rahman. Uh, a very very important role uh, in the uh, in the making of the Islamic discourse, especially in the late 19th century. This is also uh, also followed by the the uh, the unsatisfactory feelings uh, from the, some scholars uh, who uh, uh, who support uh, the uh, some. Uh, Islamic political parties, especially in the uh, in the period of the old new uh, old order uh, regime uh, uh, in the Skarno era, uh, Mashumi. So they were satisfied with the uh, with fail uh, with the failure of the Islamic political parties uh, who uh, who uh, who failed. Uh, in uh, in the first and second uh, political uh, uh, general elections, so they think that uh, uh, the uh, uh, the the shifting paradigm from the uh, political Islam to the cultural Islam would be the best way uh, to position Islam in the Indonesian Islamic uh, in in uh, in the Indonesian people public sphere. So yeah, some scholars like uh, Professor Har uh, yeah uh, Doris Majid and his contemporaries, Dawam Raharjo and Harun Nasution and also uh, Ahmad Shafi Marif and uh, yeah uh, specifically uh, Harun Nasut uh, sorry uh, Nurhalis Majid and Ahmad Shafi Marif were greatly influenced by the uh, by the uh, uh, Fadzur Rahman's philosophical uh, thought. So. Yeah, they uh, they built uh, the so-called neo neo modernist Islam in the Indonesian context. Regarding your question about the modernist Muslim and modernist Islam, yes, I think uh, we can refer to uh, we can we can refer this uh, statement to the yeah, to the uh, to the what the uh, Muhammad Abu. Uh, uh, a century ago, about the Islamic and Muslim country, uh, Islamic country and uh, and and Muslim country. Sometimes, what is Islamic? Uh, yeah, to be uh, not agreeable with the uh, Muslim practice. So yeah, Islamic, Islamic. What is Muslim? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. What is Islam? Is uh, yeah. I, yeah, I can say this. Uh, they are of the two different things in the uh, in Indonesian Islamic public sphere. But, yeah, uh, I, I didn't have further uh, statement about this. But yeah, thank you very much, Professor Muri Hassan. Uh, with this, uh, thank, uh, thank you, Erwan. Uh, Peter, do you want to say uh, about questions? These questions, Peter. Um. Well, uh, yeah, the second one. It, it, if there is a modern Islam, is there a post-modernist Islam? Um, the, the question I would have in my head, I would answer the question with a question, and that is, do we define post-modernist Islamic tafsir as tafsir that's written during the post-modernist period, or rather do we define it as tafsir that embraces and embodies all of the philosophical principles of the post-modernist era? And if it's the former, then there's plenty of tafsir that's written during the postmodernist era. If the postmodernist era begins in the 1950s, there's plenty of tafsir. But certainly in the case of Malaysia, I don't really see, I don't really see any tafsir that embodies and embraces all of, all of the postmodernist foundational principles that I talked about in the beginning of my talk, one of which is the expulsion of God from, from the conversation. In fact, it seems to me that there's a fundamental opposition between post-modernism post and tafsir, written by people who believe in God and want to put God at the center. Um, that would be my comment. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Peter. Uh, 
Thank you so much, Peter. Thank you, Erva. Thank you, Muri. Very interesting questions. There is one question. Uh, Akti says my question to Dr. Erva on chat box. What is the Indonesian government's mission in publishing scientific Quran commentaries? And what the impact of their publication in Indonesian society? Yeah, uh, yeah. Thank you very much. I already stated that uh, in the yeah, at least in the last uh, two decades, uh, yeah, since uh, 2010, uh, I'm not mistaken, uh, there is a uh, an increasing trend in the uh, Indonesian. Uh, in the Indonesian public sphere, that some Muslims uh, try to uh, try to uh, to be more interested in the Quranic scientific commentaries, and also this is also the case with the uh, the the this, uh, some of the uh, institutions in the Indonesian government who try to promote the projects of uh, uh, yeah making the publication of commentaries based on the uh, scientific uh, perspective. What is the Indonesian government mission in publishing scientific Quranic commentaries? Uh, the, the, the answer, I think it should be, uh, this question should be uh, addressed to the Indonesian government itself, but uh, yeah, uh, I think, yeah. Um, uh, the government, uh, I think, yeah, in the late uh, decades, uh, they tend to uh, uh, need uh, need kind of the legitimate from the uh, from the uh, uh, current commentaries to, I mean, uh, sorry, yeah, there's some kind of the uh, a relationship between uh, Islam and uh, and uh, and the government. Uh, some publication related, uh, I mean, uh, belonging to this category, sometimes they are being kept uh, to, do, uh, to what we call uh, bushelism. They try to uh, just, uh, they just try to uh, say something, uh, something this is, uh, this is, this is scientific findings and this is, cor uh, and this correspond to do what is stated in the Quran. I think uh, one credit should be given to uh, to, uh, to one professor uh, in uh, in Surabaya uh, that I mentioned, Professor Agus Purwanto. Uh, he tried to uh, uh, to, uh, to uh, formulate uh, the, the relationship between uh, Quran and science. Yeah. This is very interesting because his background is not Islamic studies. His background is in physics, so uh, don't have any. Uh, he uh, he doesn't have any kind of the burden uh, from uh, from from Islamic studies background. Uh, who tend to uh, just uh, how to say just to uh, say something uh, this kind of. Uh, Scientific findings correspond to uh, in line with the uh, Quranic verses, but uh, he tried to uh, to develop a uh, philosophical thought uh, among the students that uh, Quran and and science uh, are in line, in the sense that uh, more recent finding uh, should be. Uh, should be uh, should be unfilled. Uh, that's on the uh, research method, and they don't want to uh, how to say sorry. Uh, they, they just want uh, to uh, understand this kind of uh, uh, perspective, uh, not only uh, from the uh, Quranic scientific uh, approach. Sorry if uh, uh, my concept, yeah, I lost my concentration actually. So yeah, no, thank you very that, much. Yeah. That is okay, Erwan. Uh, Peter, do you wanna add further? If you wanna add further about this, the, yeah. Uh, probably, oh, look, I mean, in Malaysia, there's, um, there's you know, the, the Islamization of science um, is, has been a, you know, a sort of 
project, not a not a formal project, but it's been a topic that has been pursued for a long time, and you've had some, uh, you know, notable names. I mean, some of Professor Nagib Alatas's writing has uh, has contributed to that. There's been quite a lot of Raji Faruqi, Raji Faruqi, isn't it? Ismail Raji Faruqi. Yeah. Yes, yeah, absolutely. Um, so, so um, there's been a lot in Malaysia uh, on that particular topic. A lot coming at the uh, Islamic University um, as well. Um, so, yeah, that's a, that's a big theme that, that you find. And again, I see that as a as a response to to world trends, really. Um, so, in a sense, so if science threatens to replace God as the central pillar, then it's natural to um, to to seek to reconcile science with religious faith. Now, some of the details, some of the arguments I look at, to me, they seem a bit forced, um, but I, I understand what's going on. Um, and and, and Christian, Christians do it as well. You know, I mean, Christians look look to um, understand the scientific world. Um, so, for example, um, the the very literal understanding of creation, the biblical account of creation. Um, is no longer nearly as widespread as it used to be, and there's been a, some, something of a reconciliation between creation and the scientific discoveries of evolution and dinosaurs and so forth. Um, so it, it's an understandable process. I think it's taking place um, in, in the different religious traditions. Peter, thank you so much. I think great points. Uh, Dr. Salema? Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Akans. Uh, I have a quick question, uh, if it is not late, to particularly Peter Riddle and, and Dr. Erwan can comment on that if possible. Uh, so, uh, and it, it might be off the topic as well. So you talked about the, uh, you know, particular context in Southeast Asia, uh, Malaysia and Indonesia a lot, but I'm really curious about the direction uh, of this uh, of the tafsir works and how uh, you know contemporary mufassirs are coping with modern and uh, postmodern trends and the pressure and where it is heading at the moment i think great question <laughs> yes yes uh, who wants to go first it's not only in one context in muslim world you know around the globe uh, where it is going what's happening uh, are, not, you, are they coping well with this? <laughs> I see. Not just, not just particularly in the you know uh, South in Asia, but you say in general. Yes, yes, yes. Um, where's uh, Erfan? Would, would you like to go first, Erfan, or you'd like me to go first? I think you're the first. <laughs> well, Suleiman, I am complimented that you think that I can comment on the top here in the whole world. Um, <laughs> but it is a very good question, isn't it? It is a very good question. And, uh, and I, I mean, I suppose I have several answers. The, the easy answer is that, of course, Tafsir, like everything else, is contested. Um, and, you know, there are competing trends in Tafsir. Um, uh, wherever you look, at least wherever I look in the Islamic world, I find you know, conservative trends in Tafsir that are wanting to reaffirm old certainties and, and sort of pretend that the world is not changing in the way that it is here, then you find, you know, very current um, trends as well. But, um, I mean, that's the easy answer. I suppose what strikes me worldwide is, um, is a sense of um, anxiety on the part of Tafsir writers about the march of secularism, um, and again, I, you know, I've mentioned several times today different religious responses, and the Christian responses are the same. The march of secularism, which presents itself as progressive, um, where God is pushed from centre stage, is is the biggest challenge that I think religious people face, and I see it in Tafsir writing, and therefore naturally. I'm seeing um, Islamization of explanations of science in the Tafsir works. I'm seeing a desire to affirm the sovereignty of God um, in, in, in the Tafsir works. Um, I'm seeing a, 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 a sort of a, a search to recognize a balance between respect for difference, which, is, which post-modernity has brought in, and, and that's a good thing, 
but at the same time, not, not lose the center in the process. The thing is, if, if all you have is difference, then you have no clarity. But if you have certainty in the center and you respect difference around it, then you have a good balance. And I, I see that. I see that coming out of the, not only the Tufts here writing, but the general preaching as well. I'm quite interested to read collections of, 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 of the hopper um, that are given on, on Fridays in mosques. And I'm hearing those sorts of concerns come through. So it's this search for wanting to move forward, respect the new things that have come through postmodernist thinking, but at the same time to affirm old certainties. That's, that, that would be my response. It's a pretty general response. I hope that helps, but that's where I'm going. Right. Erwan, uh, yes, do you want to say anything about uh, the <laughs> Yeah, actually, I learned a lot from these questions. <laughs> I didn't have any comment that. Yeah. All right. Uh, I think he doesn't want to any comment. All right, then. Uh, Erwan, thank you so much. Thank you, Suleiman, for your great question. Any any questions, any comments? Uh, let me check. Time also nearly uh, finished. Uh, if you don't have any further questions, maybe you know we can finalize, we can uh, finish. Yes, Peter, maybe final remarks from the present presenters, maybe from Peter and Anwar. Okay, that's a, good, that's a good idea. Well, I, my final remark will be to give all of the, all of the audience a question. I'm going to leave you with a question because I just mentioned I just mentioned the use of the term progressive, um, which is being used. And uh, these days we hear the word progressive used very much for postmodernist thinking. Um, and of course, words always, they work in pairs, don't they? So, you know, the words work as opposites. So progressive has an opposite, regressive. And progressive is good, regressive is bad in general understanding. It's good to be progressive, it's bad to be regressive. So what does progressive mean in postmodernist terms? Regressive means, sorry, progressive means becoming postmodernist. Regressive means going back to old certainties. And I think one of the things we have to do is to challenge labels like that. Um, I'm not sure that pre-modern pre and modern is applicable to Islamic history. That's something to think about also progressive, regressive. What do we do with those? Thank you very much for being an audience for my talk and for the excellent questions. Uh, I've really enjoyed it. And I'm honored, Hakan, that you and the people at CSAC should invite me. Thank you very much. You're welcome. You're welcome. I think, Peter, your final remarks are very meaningful and you should think about this, definitely. And there are levels and uh, and we need to critically engage with these levels, you know, Definitely, but what they are putting under progressive, what they are putting under regressives, and uh, definitely uh, we need to rethink about these uh, descriptions and levels. Yes, Erwan, final uh, remarks? Uh, yeah, <laughs> sorry, I, uh, actually I don't have a final remark for this, but uh, let me uh, 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 please give us uh, one minute to uh, 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 I'm trying to uh, to answer the uh, question from Akbi uh, Asnawi. Yeah, sorry, I lost my concentrations uh, at the time. Yeah, I think uh, this is regarding the uh, impact of the uh, publication in Indonesian society. Yeah, in my opinions, the uh, the Indonesian government's mission in publishing the different commentaries. Uh, yeah, in my view, uh, it tends to be more cere uh, ceremonial uh, rather than trying to, uh, uh, to uh, uh, let's say, to, uh, to, to find out some solution uh, toward the contemporary issues. And what the impact, I'm not quite sure about this because, uh, yeah, uh, the tafsir, as, as, far as, as far as I'm concerned, this is not really well read among the Indonesian Muslims. Yeah, yeah. I don't think this. Uh, I I'm not sure whether the Muslim are more interested in uh, in readings of very voluminous. Uh, uh, I mean the yeah, uh, seer who 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 have so many pages and they just uh, read uh, sometimes in the uh, read uh, some things in the WhatsApp or 
social media, short articles, and so on. So, yeah, I'm I'm not sure about the impact of the publication in the discussion society because uh, some thick book like the Quran commentary uh, usually is not well read among the Indonesian public. Yeah, so this is uh, the second effort from me to uh, answer the uh, very uh, important uh, question from Dr. Akdi Asnawi. Thank you very much. All right. Uh, thank you so much uh, for the great presentations, Professor Peter Riddle and Dr. Erwan Nurtawab. I think uh, we had lovely discussions and very important points, very important topics to reconsider and to rethink about this. Thank you so much. As I said, uh, this session, this colloquium is recorded and will be uploaded on our Interact site. I will email it to you, the link. Thank you again for all the contributions for all the participants today to join because you joined today. Thank you so much and hope to see you next time. Thank you. And this is the end of the colloquium. Looking forward to uh, meeting you next time. Thank you so much. All right. Bye.